Hello, everyone, and welcome to Connecting with the Stars. I'm Mary Edwards, and here with Dave the Mystic, Dave Barnett, um, who is going to share with us some of his incredible stories here today with energy healing and positive encounters that he's had. Um, and, um, you know, a little bit of everything here. So anyway, <laughs> good to see you here today. Good to see <laughs> you. Open- and we always go into a lot of different things other than karmic burning, karma burning, which you're going to talk about and other things. But anyway, it always involves ETs and fun things for you. So um, Dave is a rock after a brief bio. We'll jump right in. Um, Dave, the mystic is a go- go- honest to goodness rocket scientist. He lives in Littleton, Colorado. He's been involved with alternative healing since the early 1980s and uses many healing modalities with clients from therapeutic touch, beta healing, matrix energetics, to herbs, crystals, sound, entity and energy healing, which he's gonna talk about today, soul retrieval and karma building, burning. He does a lot of work with high vibrational beings and gives talks about his energies and how they can be used on a personal basis for spiritual growth and understanding. David also works one-on-one with those seeking insights and awakening. Um, And just FYI, why I also love you, Dave, is you are a rocket scientist and mystic, like my father was and my grandfather. And you've helped me tremendously over the last few years with other friends and healing that I've been wanting to dive, dive deeper into about my past, my past lives. And so I give him a a thousand thumbs up to, um, Contact him at the end of the show if you'd like. We'll give him your your his email and go from there. But anyway, I know today you're going to talk about karmic healing and entities, uh, which you do clearings of. So you can dive in now and share what you'd like with that. We're looking forward to hearing about it. So thank, sure. thank you for being here. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about karma. Um, I joke with people, uh, but I'm semi-serious about there being little k karma and big k karma. And uh, the way I differentiate these is little k karma. Uh, when we take on an incarnation to take on a life, to um, go and uh, have our soul and soul a body and go through a set of circumstances, we have a life chart or a life plan. And you may be able to see that as a part of your selection criteria before you take on being reincarnated. And uh, you're you're showing this, but they don't want to spoil the surprise because when you come in, you're you, you come in as a blank slate. Now, lately, uh, a number of children are starting to show up, especially in the ages of two to four, where they remember their spiritual experiences and they re- may remember their past life and may still be able to uh, connect with people that they knew in the past life. It, it's a fascinating area. But you come into this life uh, with a plan, with a course of action, uh, with what's called a life chart. And we uh, we can see that in the spiritual plane. To me, when I view it, uh, working with the people who manage it called the Council of Elders, uh, it looks like a computer flow chart. And it has different choice points. And um, there are a number of lessons on there that you're going to learn. Um, and you can learn them the easy way or the hard way. Uh, you can say, I don't need no stinking high school diploma, and you go live on the streets, and you'll find that life is the hard way for you to uh, find abundance and safety and have a happy, healthy life with others, uh, whereas if you stick it out in high school, go to college, get a degree in something that's a, a usable degree uh, in the marketplace, then uh, you may prosper and, in general, do pretty well. Uh, it's up to you. It's your choice. Uh so you can learn things the easy way or the hard way. Um, so you come into this life, and uh, why would you select a particular lifetime? Um, I'm going to date myself. I go back, and I remember report cards when I was a kid, and uh, they just opened up like this. And on one side, they would have the grades in the major subjects, like uh, reading, you know, a math uh, or arithmetic even, you know, back then. I really date myself. Uh but on the other side, they had a whole, whole lot of little check boxes, and basically they were needs improvement. You know, you talk in class, you don't raise your hand, you you uh, don't follow what the teacher says and do your homework, uh, things like that. 
so little k karma to me is a whole set of these little check boxes. Uh, a lot of life's lessons where you start out with a great big long list when you started incarnating and over time with multiple lifetimes, you gradually check those off. You know, you're done with that lesson. You, you've accomplished it. You've been successful. Um, but there's still maybe some more. So you come into this life with some karma. So karma as a small k is sort of a tracking method on what do you want to learn for your spiritual progression? This isn't somebody else telling you this is what you need to know. This is you deciding with reflection, these are the things I'd like to do. Um, you know, you, you can look at a lot of people who say, uh, as they go through life, well, there's different things I'd like to learn about. Th this is kind of like that. So that's small K karma. <clears throat> to me, big K karma is when you have a choice. Um, you, you go in and rob a store. You're a bad guy. You've already made one choice. The second choice is uh, when I deal with the clerk, am I going to, uh, with my gun, am I going to harm the clerk? Uh, if you shoot the clerk, big K karma. And the big K karma is what a lot of people view as, oh, well, what goes around comes around. Uh, those types of statements. Uh, karma is going to slap you up the side of the head. Um, karma is your punishment for doing bad things. Well, that big K karma has traditionally been viewed in spiritual plane as, um, say, uh, you shot an innocent guy, Joe, and you're Bob, and you come back in another lifetime where uh, the roles are reversed and you become the victim. So you can see what it's like to be the victim of a shooting, to have your life cut short. And uh, you may come back in another lifetime where you're the mother of the victim. And so you get to experience what the grieving mother felt when her, her son was shot. Uh, unfairly, uh, that type of thing. The problem with the big K karma at this point is I see in the near future, and I mean near uh, maybe less than 100 years, uh, that we're going to go through a major energy shift, a major change in our vibrational level, and we're going to be in a place where uh, things are quite different. Things are generally better. Um, things are, are more evolved, things are higher energy, and we're all struggling to get there. We're being given challenges to uh, sort of climb up that ladder to get out of the pit and get onto the level ground where, where things are going to be generally pretty good. Well, that means we're going to leave a lot of this behind, and from what I see is we don't have centuries and centuries and centuries in front of us to continue to reincarnate to try these different scenarios over and over to get the different perspective of uh, what it was like for a particular situation. So I do see the big K karma fading away. I think as a tool of the spiritual realm for spiritual growth, I think it's, it's going to dissipate. But in the meantime, we still have it and we still have karma from past lifetimes. Uh, from my point of view, past lifetimes are still ongoing. It's not like they're just, uh, the film is in the can and the report's at 11. Uh, I see them ongoing on their timelines just as we are. And in some cases, your past lifetimes may go through a crisis or uh, a health issue where they may reach forward in time and affect you with their issue because in some way they're looking for you to help them out. So when we go back to the, the karma uh, and the karma is going away, but you still have it, um, this is where I was given a tool a number of years ago uh, for karma burning. So I was in the spiritual plane walking with one of my guides, uh, uh, a master named uh, Chua Kul out of the Tibetan tradition. Uh, he goes by DK so we can pronounce it easier. And he took me up a hillside to a large uh, house that looked like it was made out of glass. And uh, we walk inside and meet the uh, occupant of the house and he said, uh, maybe he has a complex name. I don't know. He said, just call me George. Okay, George. And he showed me a technique for burning the karma for all time for an individual. And um, I said, well, that's great. Is this something I can do? He said, well, yeah, that's why you're here. We want to show you how to do it. And so uh, with their guidance, I developed a guided meditation where I take people uh, in this guided meditation to a location it's actually like a, the ballroom in a big hotel. And I have them sit in a circle around uh, quartz crystals. And 
the rest of the seats are filled up with all the people that they have these big K karmic linkages to. Everybody shows up. Everybody has a guide behind them uh, to help uh, the process. And when we activate these big crystals in the center of the circle, it draws out the karmic energy from everybody. It looks like wisps of smoke coming out of their heart chakra. And um, we, we let that proceed until it runs out of uh, juice and everybody is clear. There's no more smoke coming out. Uh, all this energy is converted into white light and sent up through the roof of this room uh, back to the universe. And then uh, I have the people in this guided meditation uh, thank all those who showed up and then they're released and they go back to their realities and we bring this person back to their reality. So it's uh, it's an hour session that I do because I explain this in more detail and then I walk the person through it. But um, it, it's one of those things I think it's just so relieving that all karma for all ages is gone. It's It's done. I've heard of uh, some gurus or swamis or mystics in uh, places like India who do a karmic eating. They eat your karma. And um, I, uh, I applaud them for doing that. Uh, you know, that's, that's nice that they would do that. Uh, to me, energetically, that's not very appealing. Uh, I don't think that I want somebody's karma in my energy field or in my system. Uh, particularly if they have difficult ones that frequently, uh, you know, just about everybody has some hard lifetimes in the past. Uh, we aren't all little angels in every lifetime. We experience different things. So uh, that's what I do with the, the karma burning. The small K karma is just going to go on and on. It's just sort of a notebook of lessons you want to learn, opportunities to uh, learn those lessons, to try new things. Uh, but the big K karma, I, I think, is... Uh, you know, I, I'm glad I can help people get rid of it, but I'm also glad that uh, I think that that system is going to go away. There, there's so much out of Eastern religion about being on the karmic wheel, the wheel of life, that type of thing that, um, you know, their, their goal is to all strive to get off of the karmic wheel, to reach enlightenment, to go to the spiritual plane, to not ever have to have any more incarnations again. And um, the only people who... Uh, who jump that track from their point of view or the bodhisattvas who uh, have had enlightenment and then they still come back to take on another lifetime as a teacher. But uh, the big warning for them is don't do anything that incurs karma or else you'll get stuck here again. Um, I'm not sure that I like the viewpoint that we're quote stuck here. I, I don't necessarily have that view. I think uh, uh, we take on these incarnations because this is a wonderful opportunity to make rapid spiritual progress through uh, challenge and adversity. And uh, this planet certainly gives us a lot of opportunity there. But uh, but overall, I, I think uh, this is sorting itself out. So I, I think we are getting ready to move forward in a big way. I agree. I, that, that's incredible that you can actually dissipate it within a short amount of time. I'd love mm -hmm. to do that with you sometime. So, so karma is also just dissipating as an energy. I mean, it's karma under consciousness, the big level, big umbrella of consciousness anyway, correct? Yeah. Karma mm -hmm. is part of our MO. And I've heard you say before, you think karma is sort of coming to an end in certain ways too. Yeah. yeah. So could you explain, talk about that just for a minute? Because so I understand it too, and maybe others here that are listening. Well, I just think that um, in the spiritual realm, in the system that they've set up and the reasons they set up karma originally uh, for people to um, overcome this energy, you know, to experience all sides of uh, a difficult situation. Um, I, I think that that's just going away because we're, we're running out of time to uh, repeat those lives from different angles of the scenario. You know, we, we know we don't have centuries ahead of us. Uh, in order to experience these different opportunities. Well, that's incredible too, because our beings, you know, our, my star beings and your star beings help us from birth all the way along in our lifetimes to let yeah. go, help us diminish and they help groom us and get rid of some of those negative things from birth forward. Mm -hmm. and, and so, it, but what you're talking about too is taking it a step further to be able to really distinguish it. I mean, a link. Yes blast it out and so does that have to happen once in a while every few years or is that really one stop shop 
Karma. It's, I think it's one stop like shop it. because I think when we do it, we take care of it for all the other lifetimes. Now, you know, as a purist, you might say, well, Dave, you just said that those lifetimes are still ongoing in the past. And yes, they are. And could those people still do something that is karma incurring in the big case sense? Yeah, they probably could. But for the most part, I think when we uh, do this as a snapshot on somebody's life and all their past lives, uh, we pretty much uh, take care of it. Right. Cool. That's really incredible that, that we can actually do that. That's just an amazing skill that you were taught. <laughs> and then entity clearing, too. I know you talk about that um, in your soul and spirit, too. So I I don't know what you'd like to talk about. Yeah. That. yeah. You know, many gifts <laughs> of clearing. I, I we think, need uh, a lot of clearing right now, or, or always. Yeah, I, I got started with uh, entity clearing. Uh, I was, it was around 2008. I was on a trip to Las Vegas with my wife, a vacation. And while I was in a, an entryway at one of the shopping areas for one of the casinos, I got a phone call from a woman and she's in a suburb of Denver. And she said, I got your name from a, a friend of a friend of your daughter's. And um, she said, I need help. She said, there's something in my house. It is very, very disturbing. Uh, she said, we, we bought our house and it was a bargain and nobody would tell us why. And then after we moved in, we found out that the previous owner, an older man who was somewhat of a recluse, had hanged himself in the basement. Uh, but nobody disclosed that. And uh, it appeared that he's still there. And he was uh, walking up behind her and saying her name behind her head. Uh, she could be lying in bed. And he'd come over and press on the covers on top of her, which was very unnerving. Uh, her li two little children uh, is a second marriage for both her and her husband. Her two little kids, uh, like four and five, were seeing witches flying out of the closet. And uh, But she couldn't discuss it with her husband. And she had a 16-year-old stepdaughter there. And uh, she said, I can't let them know anything because the daughter would use it as an excuse to go home and live with her mother. So she said, there's, you know, kind of family politics here. And I said, well, I'm game. I'll, I'll take a shot at it. And uh, so I worked on it remotely from my hotel room and uh, just visualized it. And um, pretty much all the problems went away. And I thought, wow, that's very straightforward. I did this long distance. It's great. And um but I told her, you know, give me a call in a couple of weeks. Let me know how things are going. And she called me a couple of weeks and she said, things were fine for about a week and a half. And then uh, after two weeks, some things started coming back. And um, I used another tool that I learned. Um, in around 2004, I was in a guided meditation, or I shouldn't say guided meditation. I was in a meditation and my guide showed up and they took me to uh, a trap door in the courtyard of a castle and we went down in the trap door and it's like we were walking down a hallway to a dungeon. And at the end of the hall, we got to a heavy wooden door and they said, go ahead and push it open. And I did. And there was somebody in there strapped to some type of apparatus being tortured, you know, by nasty looking folk. And I said, what am I supposed to see here? And they said, well, this is a person who when they died, they believed that they were a sinner they believed that they belonged in hell and they had an image of what hell would look like. And uh, the creation just says, yes, okay. If, if that's what you think, if that's what you think you, you belong. And so it, it kind of manifested their vision of what their afterlife should be. They said, uh, so this is an artificial hell. They said, uh, objectively, hell doesn't exist. Uh, hells are created for people who believe they belong there. And so they're all subjective. They said, we want you to develop a protocol for getting these people back to the spiritual plane. They don't belong here. Uh, this is strictly an illusion. And so I thought about it and I thought, well, okay. So I cleaned up the person. You know, I had them stand up, got them hosed off and clean, fresh robes. And then I created a doorway in the side of that chamber. And we walked through it into what looked like a conference room at a, at a, oh, a, a business had them sit on one side of the table and uh, my guides and myself sat on the other side. And so we worked on explaining to this person that what they're in was an illusion. And uh, they, of course, uh, object to that and say, no, no, that's, that's the reality. And 
Uh, so I created a torch on a sconce on the wall, and I said, go take that torch. And so they stepped, and they took the torch. They said, open the door and look out. And when they did, it was just black void. There, there was no torture room. There was nothing there. So they put the torch back and they said, okay, yes, I agree. It's an illusion. What next? And so I worked with the guys on a plan to return them to the spiritual plane, reunite them with family, get reconciliation with uh, any victimization that had gone on in either direction and uh, move them on their way. And over time, I did this for people in purgatory, which I believe is an illusion, and limbo, which is an illusion, uh, and these personal hells. Okay, going back to the clearing, now that we digress a little bit. So um, I get the idea that maybe since this guy hanged himself, he thought he was a sinner. And uh, so I went and I found him in his own personal, personal created hell, and he still had connections to the house. And so I took him through that process of reuniting him back to the spiritual plane and disconnecting him from the house. And then I talked to the woman again. Everything had gone away. Everything was fine. And that put me on the path. And uh, being an engineer, I uh, I created a spreadsheet to identify the people and everything we're clearing and also uh, the types of entities. Uh, so I'll just show you because I'm, I'm a Virgo and I, I'm an electrical engineer in aerospace. And, and so uh, I created a, a spreadsheet like this. And so the, the people, you know, go here, then I have pets and vehicles, and then down here is uh, all the property, the land, and then across the top are the different types of entities. And, and when I first created this chart, it had about that many columns to it, and this is 2008, and then just over time, I've continued to add uh, additional uh, types of entities to, to the chart. Um, when I, when I do a clearing with people, I have them uh, also print out a copy. And so as we talk on the first phone call, I identify how many of each type of entity there are and have them put it in the chart. So they have a record of what we're looking at. I think an important thing here is to demystify it, to uh, uh, get them out of that nervous place about you know what's there. Um, one of my stories is I said, Think of me as the orkin man who comes out and, and get, gets rid of bugs in your house. And I might say, oh, I see some silverfish. I see some mosquitoes. Uh, I see some spiders. And um, I treat them all appropriately. And then I say, well, I'll come back in two weeks because sometimes, you know, you have a, uh, a tear in your screen or something that lasts more in and we'll take care of those. And uh, so come back and, and take care of those. I, I'm trying to get out of this uh, uh, very fearful scenario that you see on these paranormal shows. And uh, yeah, there there are some uh, uh, scary dark entities out there. Um, I choose in my clearings, I never go to the site and for a couple of reasons. Now, number one is uh, I don't really care to see phenomena. I'm not interested. I don't get any uh, special, you know, fear tingle out of uh, seeing phenomena. Uh, it just does nothing for me. Uh, the second thing is, I don't want the entities that are there to know that I'm coming. And a, a physical presence certainly puts them on alert, and they may start taking defensive measures. And then third thing is, I don't want the entities there to have a chance to try to attach to me. Uh, a fourth thing uh, that makes it helpful is, I can do clearings anywhere in the world, and I do. And it allows me to keep my prices very inexpensive and I can do it by phone or Zoom or whatever. Uh, and I, I've cleared uh, locations all over the world and it keeps it very easy. Um, it, you know, one of the funny things you see is uh, uh, like at a mall, if uh, uh, a pest guy is coming in, he may wear a disguise because they don't want patrons at the food court to see that a uh, you know, cockroach guy is coming in to spray down the Chinese booth, uh, that type of thing. Well, it's sort of the same thing with me. Uh, you know, if I don't go to somebody's house, they don't have neighbors wondering who's that guy who's coming and, you know, walking the property and looking around the yard. You know, this is weird. What's up? Uh, they don't have to answer those questions. So that's um, private and safe. And it's private. It's yeah. Invisible, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, uh, the, the system works very well. Um, I would say if uh, if I've encountered any challenges uh, at all, 
it's been in the ones where uh, somebody is getting voices in their head and uh, some of these entities that start talking in people's head and it can't be controlled, uh, those can be very, very difficult. And that starts getting over into that gray area. Is this a possession or is it looking like it's going to be a possession? And uh, I, I don't do exorcisms. Uh, it, it's just not my cup of tea. I don't care to be around somebody who could potentially take on another personality and become violent. Um, that, that again, uh, gets into the, the creepy factor for me. That's, uh, that's too much for me. But these people start getting a voice in their head. They, they've either dabbled or they, they uh, uh, annoyed, highly annoyed somebody who's very powerful, who puts something like this in them. Uh, th those uh, can be very challenging to remove. And I'm not always successful on that. Um, just like uh, anything to do with metaphysics or intuition, uh, nobody is ever 100% right, 100% accurate, 100% effective. Uh, we all do the best we can. Uh, healing, nobody's at 100. percent If they were, they'd have a line out their front door a mile long. You know, everybody be in line for them, and they have a, a mountain of crutches and wheelchairs in front of their house. So uh, we all do the best we can, and in a lot of cases, we're successful. But um, I, I'd be wary if somebody says that uh, you know, like for healing. My healing system can work on everyone. Uh, I don't believe that to be true. I think there's many different modalities. Uh, number two is my healing system, you know, will always work on the condition you have, and I can always be successful doing it. And if you hear those things, those are warning signs. Uh, we all do the best we can. Uh, nobody goes to the doctors. Yeah, you know, we all go to the doctor, hopeful that the doctor is going to help us. But we never go to the doctor saying, absolutely 100% guarantee that doctor is going to take care of this. And he would stake his reputation and his fees on it. No, you never hear that. Uh, you know, they, they call it practicing medicine. And uh, so we- and you're not uh, gonna live forever and, on all those things. I mean, it's not with this. Yeah. The thing is what you're, you're honest too. You know what your skill set is and you've helped me so much with this too. Actually, this triggers a couple of different things maybe we could do as an experiment right now that I had sure. up till just now. Um, one of the things Dave has done with me in my learning and experimenting, I have beings. Dave has been tremendously helpful with friends whose kids have passed and helped talk about clearing entities. Maybe we can do a quick experiment on me. Um, do you want so people can see how you do a reading if you if you'd like to do that and just he what he does is he can read my energy he can read clearing and me that need elimination um he's he's noticed he's helped me with implants removing implants with clones with other entities on my in my area in my scope of my consciousness here and um and then he also has this incredible um gift and that he's been refining over the couple of decades of called the level of consciousness of, of allowing um, him he has the gift to see what we are our et human hybrid breakdown is from how much human we are to how much et we are and i've had him do this regularly for me over time because i i can't do it myself so maybe if you would, if you have, if you'd like to, we could do a little clearing on me, and you could, and people can see how quickly and how effectively you can. I don't know if I have any cooties around today, or you could read my aura sure. or whatever, because you're so good at it. I mean, these would be two things that people could contact you for to um, get some really incredible, trustworthy information that I that I love, and I've connected you with many of my friends and colleagues to get a reading with you because you have many gifts so and you can say whatever you want i mean i you know i'm an open book so uh, whatever whatever creepy it is or whatever i need clear i don't you know i don't care and whoever and you can also say if i have a pladian near me or an arcturian friend who are usually by my side um he when i told him actually a few weeks ago that i heard my door in my little condo that i live here in san francisco that i heard my door wide open and then slam shut in the middle of the night a few weeks ago and I knew I saw I felt an entity here and I couldn't see it and I couldn't I could feel it and I called him the next morning and I said oh I had somebody visit last night and he said oh that was an Andronoman who was here to visit you and check out your apartment because I've been doing off-planet subsurface habitats in the solar system for 
decades and a lot recently in the last couple of years. So he knew, and I felt something over there that was positive. And I said, please present yourself because I'd love to know what you're doing. You know, he was here checking out my my apartment to, um, he was getting borrowed by, by the Pleiadians and the Arcturians to work on a, on a habitat. And he was here checking out my space. And so he dissolved, I didn't really have fear, but I was curious what was, who the heck was here? And he immediately um, resolved that question for me in just a few minutes on a, on a short phone call. So um, anyway, do you want to just dive in and do a little bit of this? I, I think this would be fun sure, for others sure. to see what you, these gifts that you have. Yeah, well, starting out with the uh, the clearing worksheet, I just went ahead while you were talking and uh, went through uh, the row uh, across for you. And what I found around you, and I'll get rid of this stuff in a few minutes, uh, an earthbound spirit uh, is, is hanging around you. Earthbounds are people who've died and they didn't go to the spiritual plane. Uh, there's naive about spirituality uh, as an earthbound in the astral plane as they were when they're alive. And so they're confused. They don't know that they're supposed to go to, to heaven or that there uh, aren't some obstacles there for them. And uh, so there's one of those. And Can you identify who that is or does it not matter? The stranger. Yeah. Okay. All right. So somebody who's uh, just come across you and found a compatibility. Um, there's a dark entity that I call a mimic around you. That's uh, this is a dark entity that tries to masquerade as being something positive, like an angel or a guide. And at this point, they aren't terribly powerful. They're mainly just a confusion factor. So we'll move that on. Um, I found uh, a portal in your energy field and. Uh, this is a trap door. It allows energies to come through from the astral plane. These are uh, anywhere from annoying things to very dark things. It could be demonic. It could be uh, oh, ogres. It could be uh, gremlins, uh, all types of things. And uh, they use this as a sneak path to come into your space and then exit your energy field and get into your surroundings. And so uh, I'm going to take care of all of these and... Uh, I'll just take a moment here. And uh, we've taken care of those. Um, the other thing we can look at here is uh, you're talking about the, the hybridization mix. Uh, so let me explain that a little bit. Uh, this goes back, uh, again, to almost 2008, 2009. Um, I'm very familiar with the idea of people being hybrids. And uh, the way we're using that term here is uh, you have an ET as one parent and a human as the other parent, and somehow things were arranged that uh, we ended up with uh, developing a person who was DNA-wise half and half, and uh, we call those hybrids. Uh, I've seen some of these people walking around. They uh, frequently, uh, they come across as being uh, very beautiful young women in their 20s, early 30s. Uh, they overdress in meetings where they come in in uh, highly elegant suits, sunglasses. And uh, a lot of times they wear the sunglasses because their eyes are just a little bit different. Uh, it seems like they're a little bit farther apart and they're usually, it looks like they're a little bit wider at the outside corner. Um, but not always. Um, I mean, but, just more ET, more ET. Yeah, yeah. And so intuitively, when I've picked up on these people, if they notice me noticing, uh, I frequently see them getting their stuff together and they'll leave the meeting and disappear uh, because they don't want to be outed, so to speak. And uh, that's fine. That's that's their, their thing. Um, but I also found that uh, a lot of things have evolved. And this is one of the fascinating ones is that people are being energetically hybridized. 
And uh, what this means is that you may have a percentage that's not just 50% or 25% of these ty different types of energies. You might have 15% or 19% or 87%. And so what I started doing is uh, muscle testing. And I, I muscle test on my hands like this. So this is uh, yes, strong, true. This is no, false, uh, weak. Uh, and it's, I can do it on either hand uh, so I can write while I do it. And uh, I've worked for years and years to become very clear on this, to become very fast and efficient, uh, but uh, to always focus on the clarity of uh, bringing through information this way uh, for the, the highest and best good. And uh, so what I started doing, and I'll, I'll hold up the chart in a minute, is uh, coming up with a little graph here. Pardon me while I write this down. And so come up with a set of horizontal boxes where uh, we talk about human, uh, ET, angelic, gods and goddesses, and ascended masters. And then uh, I usually have some other categories I put after that in, in smaller percentages. It might include uh, the gin, where we get genies from. It might include dragon energy. It might include Sasquatch energy. Uh, but I go through this line here and... What I do is I just look at the percentage for each one. So if we're uh, evaluating Mary for her human percentage uh, for today uh, and Mary's dynamic, hers changes uh, frequently. I, uh, for the human, I get uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21. So I get 21% human energy. Um, for the ET, I get 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 55, 56, 57. So 56%, so that takes us to 77% of the total. Angelic is 5, 10, 15, 14, 13, so I get 13%, so that takes us to 90. If I look at gods and goddesses energy, uh, and there is a realm under the creator of gods and goddesses, and they're nothing like the mythological figures, um, I get uh, 5, 10, 9, 8, 7, so I get 7%, so that takes us to 97%. And if I look at Ascended Masters, I get one, two, three, so 2%. Two so that takes us to 99%. Uh, but when I plot the chart now, it looks like this for Mary. And uh, sometimes what I do for Mary is I also split out the, uh, the ET percentages into different races. Um, that can be a challenge for me uh, when I muscle test to see how many ET races are hanging around the planet right now, either being helpful or just watching or in some small percentage cases being harmful. Uh, I get over 340 different ET races and uh, many, many of them have their own languages and uh, have their own names. And so I, I'm frequently at a loss for uh, what to call them. And sometimes I just get designations like, X21 or something. Uh, I don't have any better way to define who and what they are or, or where they're from. They may come from our universe. They may come from other universes. They may come from distant galaxies um, of which we have uh, very little or no knowledge. Uh, we don't even see it. So um, I just, uh, I'd like to do it this way. And uh, the fascinating thing about this um, Oh, can you just go back for a second and do the breakdown for me just so they know? Because it's sort of fun to hear. Because over okay. time, over the last couple of few years, what I've been doing this per, pretty regularly um, with Dave is it shifts from mostly Palladian, Arcturian, and, and then I have some Satchwan. It, it's really interesting. And the more I've gotten into this spiritual world and this and dove more deeply the last couple of years into totally consciousness and shifting my whole life towards being on this path to play my part as an artist and designer and sort of a spiritual healer of spaces and on planet and off, it has changed dramatically. And it's been really fun to watch the shifts because everything, like you say, is dynamic. So anyway, I'm not, I think it's just be fun for other people to see what, how he does this level of consciousness. He calls it the LOC, this 
system that he's um, manifested and created and fine tuned over the over time, as he said. And the more I focus on this, the more I focus on the interviews, books, speaking um, on TV or on radio shows like Dave's or other, and like uh, it, it, it continues to go up because my level of consciousness is shifting and elevating a bit. So, so this is how I split these out. Uh, I know my my writing isn't great when I'm writing fast, but the uh, out of the 56%, 33% of that is uh, Pleiadian, 12% uh, is Arcturian, 4% is Andromedan, 2% is Syrian, 3% is Zeta Reticuli, and other, I just have 2%. So um, that's sort of uh, where Mary is today. And uh, tomorrow she might be quite different, uh, but we don't know. Uh, some people are very, very stable. Uh, I think Mary, given her uh, journeys to other planets to uh, help on things, I think she may get dynamically hybridized uh, to make it easier for her to blend in or fit with uh, the tasks she's being asked to do. So, uh, right, will you also just talk about that a little bit? Because I'd love to hear it from you. I've mentioned, I've started mentioning this on different shows and and things, but if you could just yeah. describe. Dave's been helpful looking back at nine, my 94 generations of basically my ancestry, my DNA, which is what everybody's very interested in today, other than consciousness. What are we doing here? What's our purpose and why me? Which I've asked him and my beings mm -hmm. for a long time. But anyway, let, I'll let Dave describe it better because he can probably describe me better than I can <laughs> right now. I mean, we know it's a combination of things, but I'll let him share with you how he's been so helpful to help clarify things for me too in my life and how quickly they've changed actually. Well, in the, the bigger picture of things, uh, if we go back in history, if we, we go back to the Old Testament, uh, there's two two books called Kings and Chronicles because there there's a tremendous interest in terms of lineage and uh, your your genetics. They, they couldn't have defined genetics back then, but they knew there was something special in some family lines. Uh, we see that in uh, royalty up to the present day in terms of who's who. We saw it in uh, Egypt with uh, the lineage of the pharaohs. Uh, so um, uh, we, we even see it uh, coming out in spades when they're talking about what is Jesus' heritage and a prediction of who Jesus was and uh, the, the house of David uh, type of, of lineage for him to to prove that uh, there was something special about him that came out of his DNA. Well, Mary, as it turns out, as we've been working, has uh, a lineage that goes back uh, almost to the, the year zero. Um, and it looks like over, over the decades, over the centuries, that there's been some uh, pruning and alteration on her, her family lineage. And... Uh, so Mary is the result of uh, a little bit of tweaking along the way uh, in a lot of generations. And uh, if you look at, uh, for what we have history on the past uh, three or four centuries for Mary, um, a lot of notable people, a lot of, uh, a lot of good genes, a lot of people, not just lucky, not just being in the right place at the right time, but it's uh, having the intellectual tools and, uh, uh, the family to to take advantage of their gifts and skills. And so when we get to Mary, we find an interesting mix where uh, she's had challenges due to uh, how her brain is wired, uh, but how her yes, brain TV, is wired. ADD, dyslexia, yeah. <laughs> stress. But how her, her brain is wired has also made her very quick on the uptake in different specialized areas, such as the uh, uh, design area and the art that she's involved in. And um, there also appears that with these uh, ETs watching her and kind of uh, coaxing uh, the family tree, that there were plans for her on how she would be helpful uh, in this life uh, with them. And so it, it's really come through uh, a whole lot that uh, Mary's been kind of uh, groomed for a role of uh, being taken off planet and 
working with these different races to help them understand the human perspective on aesthetics. And, um, it, you know, it's one thing to have a, a, a three or six month uh, journey in space where you're surrounded by bland walls and uh, you try and make the best of it. And it's considered to be a, a temporary condition, what a fighter pilot would go through or a, on a long mission or something. It's quite a different thing to start saying, if people are going to start leaving planet Earth and going to other planets where habitats are arranged, where we get back into uh, uh, our temperature range we need, the gravity we need, and those can all be artificially controlled by these ETs. Uh, the next thing is, what is the psychological health uh, for these people? You know, what are their expectations? Because they're leaving a planet that you walk outside on the surface, it's it's got a lot of greenery. It's got a lot of uh, beautiful things. And you go to these other places and they say, well, this is what we, we see. And you say, well, this, this, this looks like the decor in a McDonald's, you know, and I'm going to see this for the next 10 or 20 years. I don't think so. Uh, it's got to look different. And so it appears that uh, Mary has been helping to coach them on uh, how to work with the uh, the, the visual range of color that humans see, because many of the ETs see either a different range or a wider range of color. They, they may see into the ultraviolet, they may see into the infrared where we don't normally see. And so they may have a richer experience where um, they might look at what looks like a blank white wall to us, and yet it's been painted with uh, a lot of different shades that we can't distinguish. So to them, it's visually enticing Whereas to us, it's like, uh, it's just a white wall. What are you trying to tell us here? And uh, so um, Mary seems to have been uh, making a lot of these trips to help them understand how to make these places more homey, more uh, more appealing, more enjoyable, uh, to uh, uh, work with spaces. Um, you know, one of the things that happens in a lot of these places is that they, they hollow out a great big area underground and create something. an environment and uh, you know for humans uh, we do like kind of snug little rooms uh, you know if, yeah if you see this thing uh, on, on the right side of the screen that looks like a giant Quonset hut uh, it may be hundreds and hundreds of yards long well people don't like to just sleep out in the open on a routine basis and something like that they're going to want to have subdivided spaces that they can tailor to themselves and personalize. And uh, so Mary is helping these uh, other uh, beings from other planets understand what it is that we find aesthetically pleasing out of our culture and uh, not just uh, have to uh, put up with something that looks like a warehouse. Um, yeah, this, this uh, that kind of... Uh, moldy uh, building at the bottom is uh, sort of how some of the Pleiadians uh, create their living space. And so they're into curves rather than squares and their building materials and design style uh, allow them a uh, free form expression. Uh, we've dabbled in it with spray on concrete on structures and things, but um, we, we aren't used to it yet, you know, living in uh, igloo-like things. Uh, we, we still seem to have kind of a preference for kind of boxy buildings that kind of uh, are the space that we're used to. So um, Mary seems to have been uh, put into a place to uh, help them understand um, how we see the world and also help them to um, sort of culturally appreciate what we find to be pretty, beautiful, uh, pleasing, uh, enticing in terms of artwork. Yeah, it's, uh, they, they have just a different view. Uh, they have different sensitivities. They, they've evolved to different places. And um, so it, it might be like us going and uh, going to Borneo and, and working with a primitive tribe. Well, uh, they, might, they might not appreciate uh, the Mona Lisa. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that's meaningful to us and to them it might be, uh, who's the chick, you know, in the, in the painting. Um, and to them, no big deal, whereas they might have some uh, very sophisticated uh, uh, pictograms on walls, uh, cliff walls or caves 
that to them are extremely meaningful and have a lot of uh, energy and power. And we look at them and say, uh, this looks like a kindergartner uh, drew these. You know, what's going on? You know, why are these so special to you? So uh, Mary is helping to uh, culturally educate uh, some of these ET races to help them understand how best to uh, work with uh, what might be larger groups of people down the road. Um, there's some of the habitats that Mary has worked with uh, in terms of uh, uh, our, our first attempts to get into space and to look at how we deal with things. And when we deal with spacecraft, uh, the strongest structure in the spacecraft is first is a sphere and the next is a cylinder uh, because of the internal air pressure. It has to be uh, round to be strong. And uh, so suddenly we're dealing with, well, how do you fit uh, square linear people into a round tube and have them appreciate the fact that they have this opportunity. And so Mary's done a, a lot of work on uh, how to make people happy or happier and not go nuts uh, in space station type environments where uh, the space, uh, the volume is very limited and it, um, it it's designed to be more functional than it is to be uh, uh, interesting or enticing. Right. And what's crazy too, because Dave knows this as much as I do, I mean, we've been talking about a lot, is I kept saying, why me? And, you know, my trips off planet started at age 10 to create these uh, inside planet interior habitats from drab to happier, more functional, friendly environments. So, I mean, they have been watching me since my, for these 94 generations. My dad was a rocket scientist, so was his grand, my grandfather. And then they've watched me with my interior, my art, my interiors, and my structure and architecture school. So what's fascinating to me how Dave can weave this all together and help me and anybody else sort of piece together, you know, a thread of healing and design that has gone through my lifetime all the way back and my father's and my grandfather's to not only create structure, his dad and his dad did rockets down to the, the bomb with, um, you know, Einstein and then the lots of different projects that he's worked, what he did with the government and NASA. So what's cool is they are grooming me and us and you for all of us to play whatever part it is. And Dave has been so remarkable that he's really helped me through looking all of my past lives from Atlantis when I was a doctor, an energy healer. I was an architect in um, Egypt, design, helping design the pyramids to up to the present. So what, what he's allowed me, because I don't have the capability of doing that, is, and I, I know a lot from him and from the beings who've been talking to me for a long time, they just kept saying, keep going, Mary, keep going. But to have somebody that can weave all this together has been so incredible. And they are watching and they do help. And it's totally changed my life from my first time on Craft at age five that I, where I was so scared and freaked out when my dad was with me. And then at six, when I went, and then at 10, when they let me go off on my own to Mars and Jupiter and Pluto, put stats in my head to help round out my creative brain with more information and math and science. So um, it's been just a fascinating journey with Dave to have um, spend the time and the energy that I've done recently during COVID. Of course, everything changed in COVID. I did book. I started <laughs> again. I mean, I was I love being isolated and confined, like when I worked on the space station for NASA, I was isolated and confined here in my little condo, as we all were in different ways, not like astronauts, obviously. But it's been just such a blessing to have been able to track so many different levels of my own uh, lifetimes to my own energy shifts, how they've been accelerating and how you know, I'm, I'm going on more trips all the time. I've been off planet, you know, probably several, you know, several times in the last month and have been since I dove into this. But it's just been just such a, a great education for those of us who don't know how to do everything. And Dave knows how to do a lot of things. <laughs> for me because yeah, I thought I was crazy my whole life having these dreams and not being able to validate them myself. I've gone to lots of different readers and astrologers and stuff for 40, 50 years. And Dave has been able to help pinpoint a lot of these different areas for me. So that's why I'm so really grateful and having him back here for the third or fourth time. And we'll continue to have him back to share his incredible skills and gifts 
to um, what he's done with me, which I just showed. And I'm glad I have my book right here on my desk. Um, but also, David, um, thank you so much uh, for your information today. And if you'd like to give them your website so they can contact you and then just say a couple parting words because we're out of time. Sure. But I, we know we're in a beautiful time right now of change and division and total shift. And so we're here to finally tune how we can be more helpful and useful as a of service to humanity on and off planet, whatever we're here to do. I happen to be in art and design and started carrying on my family intergenerational ancestry, but it's, it's for, we need personal hygiene and also energetic hygiene too, like what Dave was talking about, to removing these things if we don't know how to do it ourselves. So anyway, thank yeah, you. My, my website is www.davethemystic, all one word, .com. And it has um, a little widget on there where you can send me an email if you want to inquire about using the services. I have a lot of little uh, video snaps on there that explain uh, the different services I offer. So yeah, feel free to contact me and uh, I look forward to working with you. All righty. Well, thank you so much for everyone for coming and please keep looking on YouTube and on Conscious Awakening Network for connecting with the stars. And again, thank you. Thanks a million, Dave, for all your, your generosity and your incredible skills that you share with me and all. Oh, you're, you're so, so welcome. Everybody have a good day and take care of each other and yourselves and contact Dave if you like. <laughs> take care. We'll see you. <laughs>